Okay, so we have to start with uh, we have to start with um, reactivities of these of the monoxides and uh, with the different reagents. So let me bring it as a question. Discuss the reactivity of monoxides of group four elements with the first part we call dilute and the concentrated acids and two dilute and concentrated alkynes. So let's entirely look at uh, what this reaction is all about. And we really see uh, how we can uh, go about it. Reactivity of monoxides. So uh, last time, we looked at how these monoxides can be formed. So now we can look at how they do react with the concentrated acids and the concentrated the concentrated acids and then dilute acids also with the, the alkalis, concentrated alkalis and dilute alkalis. Uh, so if such a question comes general like this, you also have to be smart and you do other needful. And how do we go about it? Let's begin with the, the reaction with the dilute acids. Let's first look at reaction. With the dilute acids. Uh, the number one thing you should know, you should first note that carbon monoxide being a neutral, it does not react with the dilute acids. Okay, you have to note that, that carbon monoxide, it is a separate word, carbon monoxide is a neutral, is doesn't react with dilute acids. That is one, two. You also note that also silicon monoxide, okay? Silicon monoxide is neutral. Silicon monoxide is neutral. And also hence does not silicon monoxide is a neutral also does not react with the dilute acids. Uh, after having looked at these two, then you also talk about um, uh, we also talk about now germanium monoxide. When germanium monoxide react, when it reacts with uh, dilute acids, we form we form the salts of germanium two. So we form germanium two salts and water. Okay, so for germanium, germanium reacts. So we shall say germanium monoxide. Of course, you have to be writing the words. I'm going to send you guiding knots, germanium monoxide reacts with dilute 
as it is from germanium from germanium to salts and water and what we do shall have germanium monoxide solid reacting with uh, a dilute acid maybe it can be hydrochloric acid it can be sulfuric acid we shall form germanium salt which i will say germanium iron and water that is how germanium monoxide reacts uh, tin the monoxide of tin what we call tin to oxide that is tin to oxide also does the same tracks with dilute acids to form tracks with dilute acids to form tin to salts tin to salts and water whereby we shall have tin monoxide or tin to oxide plus an acid we shall form tin to and then the water in a liquid state. So now, this is simply how the monoxides react. Then we have got the one of lead. Okay, we've got the one of lead. You have to talk about all carbon monoxide does not react because it is neutral. Silicon does not react because it is neutral. Germanium reacts with the dilute acid to form germanium two salts. Tin reacts to also form tin to salts. Now from this, from this, we continue now to talk about the one of lead. Lead. For the case of lead, uh, I'm summarizing this, but I'm going to send you the notes about these things I'm talking about. Uh, when you talk about uh, the lead to oxide or the monoxide of lead, it reacts slowly, it reacts slowly with the cold dilute hydrochloric acid and the dilute sulfuric acid, okay? And the reaction is stopped. Because the result of it stopping, there's a result of forming the insoluble chloride and the soluble the, the insoluble chloride and the insoluble, sulf, uh, the insoluble sulfate. So when lead to oxide reacts with hydrochloric acid, of course, you're going to form lead to chloride in the reaction PBO, that is lead to oxide solid. If it reacts with the hydrochloric acid, we'll do so to form lead to chloride, but that lead to chloride is a precipitate it is insoluble so plus water the same applies to sulfuric acid you'll form lead to sulfate but lead to sulfate and lead to chloride are insoluble so that's why we say that the reaction stops due to the formation of the insoluble metal radicals that is the sulfate and the and the chloride then um However, you should note that since all nitrates are soluble, this lead to oxide when it reacts with the nitric acid, it forms lead to nitrate, and lead to nitrate is very is very soluble. All right, lead to nitrate is very soluble. So, uh, lead to oxide reacts with dilute nitric acid and it reacts with dilute nitric acid we shall form lead to nitrate and water that reason as why i say aqueous it's because the nitrate is soluble that reason as why i say solid it's because the chloride formed is insoluble 
even the sulfate that would be formed would be very, very insoluble. Now, after looking at that, uh, we would have covered the reaction with uh, dilute acids, okay? Then when we go to concentrated acids, with the concentrated acids, carbon monoxide does not react with concentrated acids, silicon monoxide does not react with, uh, with, uh, with uh, dilute acid, Whereas the lead two oxide checks with the only excess concentrated hydrochloric acid to form a complex of tetrachloroprambate two ions, okay, which is the color of the solution, and then water. You have said that lead two oxide reacts with the excess hydrochloric acid. Form a complex of tetrachloroprambate two. Tetrachloroprambate two, tetrachloro, those are four chlorine atoms. Tetrachloroprambate, the complex of lead is a plumbate. So tetrachloroprambate two ions, all right? Uh, so that is mainly, at least the only oxide that undergoes reaction with the concentrated acids, and it undergoes reaction with the only concentrated hydrochloric acid. Uh, then from this, we go to another reaction, which is with alkalis, reactions with alkalis. Reactions with alkalis, and we shall begin with the dilute alkalis. You should note that monoxides of group four elements, all of them, there is no monoxide that reacts with the dilute, Acid. So you need first note for us that monoxides do not react with the dilute alkalis. That is it. They don't react with the dilute alkalis, but can react with the concentrated alkalis. With a concentrated alkali, uh, you begin with the carbon monoxide. This carbon monoxide, it reacts with the fused sodium hydroxide to form sodium methanoate, okay? Reacts with the fused sodium hydroxide to form sodium methanoate. Fuse the sodium hydroxide, that is the sodium hydroxide in solid form. So we shall have carbon monoxide plus sodium hydroxide shall form sodium methanoate. Okay? We shall form sodium metha, sodium methanoate. Okay, then uh, the one of silicon, because you have to talk about each monoxide. Silicon oxide, or what you can call silicon monoxide, does not react with the concentrated alkalis. Remember, for dilute, al for dilute alkalis, there is no monoxide that reacts. Okay, no monoxides react with the dilute alkalis, but with the concentrated alkalis, tin, uh, uh, carbon monoxide reacts with the fused sodium hydroxide to form 
sodium methanoid, silicon monoxide or silicon dioxide, uh, rather silicon two oxide does not. Okay. Um, for the case of tin, tin two oxide, for it reacts with the hot concentrated alkyls to form stannate ions. Actually, stannate two reacts with hot conch alkyls to form stannate two ions. How does it do? You have tin oxide plus an alkali. We have said that we form standard two. Standard two ions are written like this. And then water liquid. Eh? Or if one doesn't want to use this, you will have your tin Two oxide plus the hydroxyl ions in place of water. Still, you form your standard, but in this case, it will be written as OH4, then two minus. So that is also a standard ion. So, in that case, you don't add water because for this reaction, that's why you consider the water this side so that we don't add it here. So, for the first reaction, for the first reaction, tin, tin two oxide has reacted with the hydroxide ions. This is with the hot concentrated to form standard two ions. But if you carry out the reaction in, term, in, for, uh, we in water, in place of water, you form a standard without adding water molecules. So uh, then after knowing how a Tin reacts. You also need to know how the lead to oxide reacts. If it is lead to oxide, the lead to oxide will react with uh, the hydroxide ion We shall form a planet. We form a planet to ion. And that is, you can write PbO2 to minus, then you add water, or you can write PbO plus 2OH. We form a plumbit, actually, in place of water, we shall form a plumbit. We shall form a plumbed iron, plumbed two iron. So you need to be very, very careful as you write these equations. Right. Um, so that is how these substances react with uh, dilute alkyls and acids, and also with the dilute rather with the concentrated alkyls and acids. So uh, it can keep being revised on that format. And uh, now, before we go to trichlorides, we need to look at the redox properties of these monoxides. Because some monoxides are reducing the agents, for example, the carbon monoxide, okay? The carbon monoxide is a reducing agent, okay? So it reduces substances by removing oxygen from them and then uh, We shall add in that work. Uh, rather, sorry, we shall we shall look at the redox properties of monoxides, and we've seen that carbon monoxide is uh, an ox is, an, is a reducing agent. And if, for example, if you consider a reaction like where lead to oxide reacts with the carbon monoxide, 
we shall see that lead to oxide is reduced by carbon monoxide to lead because reducing, we are removing oxygen and this reducing agent for it, it gets oxidized. So when we say that carbon monoxide is a reducing agent, it means that it has removed the, the oxygen from lead and itself will be oxidized to carbon dioxide. So we form a lead solid, you have to be careful in writing then, plus the carbon dioxide gas. What does it imply? Lead to oxide has been reduced by carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide, which is a reducing agent has been oxidized to carbon dioxide. Okay. Um, from here, after that, members, I would love to move strictly to tetrachlorides, the very interesting part, the most interesting part, the most interesting part of group four elements, the tetrachlorides. Group four elements. Now, if I'm asked, uh, what do you know, members, about the tetrachlorides of group four? Someone to tell me what they know about the tetrachlorides of group four. Mm. Tetrachloride. If I say a tetrachloride, what do I mean? Mm. What does tetra mean? Blues. Yes, sir. Tetra means four. What do you know about tetrachlorides of group four? Uh, I, I hadn't covered the tetrachlorides of group four. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, here it means that we're going to look at those compounds of group four where you have the chlorine atoms as four. Okay. So we have, for example, carbon tetrachloride C, that is carbon, tetrachloride Cl4, the chlorides are four. You've got silicon tetrachloride, you've got silicon, a tetrachloride Cl4. We have got germanium tetrachloride, that is GE, tetrachloride Cl4. We've got tin tetrachloride, so we have SN, Cl4. We have got lead tetrachloride, PbCl4. So these are tetrachlorides of group four. Uh, for the case of physical state, from carbon tetrachloride up to tin tetrachloride, all these ones are colorless liquids. They are colorless liquids. They appear in a liquid state. Whereas this of lead, lead tetrachloride, is a yellow liquid. So uh, this is the physical, this is the physical state. This is the physical state of these, uh, of these chlorides. Eh? This, these are the physical states. Then after knowing the physical states, 
We need to know the type of bonding. All these tetrachlorides, they, they are covalently bonded. So in other words, when we say the bonding of group four tetrachlorides, all of them are covalent, okay? So they take covalent bonding. So they are covalent. Then some other property which you normally consider is the volatility. Volatility, volatility. Those ones who follow me on the face equilibria, because I decided to handle that by YouTube. So uh, phase equilibria uh, tells us that volatility is the tendency of a substance to escape into the vapor phase. So when we talk about the volatility of this tetrachloride, you see, all of them are non-volatile, non-volatile. Even if you hit them to what extent there is none that is going to escape to the vapor phase, and that one calls them, uh, rather that one brands them non-volatile compounds. Then for the sake of shape, for the sake of a shape, all of them are tetrahedro. So they are all tetrahedro in shape. So we've seen their formulas, we've seen their physical appearance, we've seen the bonding, we've talked about volatility, we've talked about shapes. So uh, after having known this now, you can go and talk about bonding itself, okay? We've known the part of these substances. So now uh, the ideal procedure is now to discuss the chemistry behind these uh, components, behind these uh, compounds, sorry. Now, you need to know that uh, since we say that all the molecules are tetrahedro, okay, Cov they are tetrahedro, covalent, and liquids, regardless, they uh, leave alone the color, that these ones are colorless and these ones are yellow, leave the color alone, they are all liquids at room temperature. They are all liquids at room temperature. And therefore, therefore, we are going to find that their bonds, their bonds are polar. We're going to look into the details of the polarity. Now, allow me fire you a question that I want us to discuss. Carbon tetrachloride is a question. Uh, it's supposed to be in words, but let me use formula. Carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar. Yet, the carbon chlorine bond the carbon chlorine bond is polar that is the question that i want us to answer and understand very 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 pretty well now the question is can you explain why carbon tetrachloride is nonipolar when large the carbon chlorine bond is polar. Carbon chlorine bond is the one which associates to, to the formation of carbon tetrachloride. So now if I may ask a question, members, what does the polarity mean? What is it when we say polar? What is the polarity? Huh? Before I bring in my simple chemistry, what is polarity? What is it when we say polarity? Shall me try? Mm. To me, polarity, I understand it as like something, it dissolves in, in water. Mm. Yes. I'm trying to, to use, I'm trying to look at the simpler 
chemistry I can use. So it, when we say polarity, look at separation of charge. Okay? Separation of charge. And that separation of charge is as a result of the differences in the electronegativity of the compounds that are involved. Differences in electronegativity. Because when these atoms are different in electronegativity, in this case, we are looking at carbon and chlorine. In other words, chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. The atom which is more electronegative will try to pull electrons towards itself. Carbon, or rather chlorine, will be trying to pull electrons towards itself. What am I trying to mean? I am having carbon, I am having chlorine, meaning that carbon would be, electrons will be pulled from carbon to chlorine simply because chlorine is more electronegative the tendency of an atom to remove bonding electrons from other atoms is what we call electronegativity. So when we say that chlorine is more electronegative, it means that it withdraws electrons from carbon more strongly to itself. And when it brings electrons more strongly to itself, uh, where the electrons are coming from, it will become partially positive. And where they are going to that more electronegative element, it becomes partially negative. And this is what we call the distribution of charge or what we call separation of electric charge leading to a molecule, its chemical groups having an electric dipole moment. In other words, when these electrons are unequally shared between the atoms, because they are going to be equal sharing of electrons in this particular case because of the differences in electronegativity, electronegativity. Mm -hmm. Because of the differences in electron negativity, you cannot expect equal sharing of those electrons. Now, uh, we are saying that when there is an equal sharing of electrons leading to formation of different electric charges, dipole moments arise. When we say a dipole moment, a dipole moment occurs when there is that separation of charge. In other words, it occurs in those compounds which are polar. Okay, which are polar. Carbon, chlorine are bond. There is a dipole moment established as a result of an equal sharing of electrons or an equal distribution of the charges, whereby the electrons are being pulled to a more electronegative atom from a less electronegative atom from carbon to chlorine. So I expect dipole moment in there. So we are saying that that dipole moment can occur, actually need to master this also, the dipole moment can occur between two ions in an, in an ionic bond, or it can occur between two atoms in a covalent bond. It generally arises from the differences in electronegativity. The larger the difference in electronegativity, the larger the dipole moment. You need to note that. And still the distance between the charge separation is also a deciding factor on to the size of a dipole moment. When we say dipole moment, this is a measure of the polarity of a molecule, measure of the polarity of a molecule. And when we say polarity, we are looking at an equal distribution of charge or the distribution of electric charge or the separation of charges. So in other words, a dipole moment is a subset of polarity because polarity is that separation of charge, separation of a charge. Because these ones are, are different in electronegativity, a charge has been shared. A charge has been separated. Carbon is partially positive. Chlorine is partially negative, making the bond polar. And when the bond is polar, there will arise dipole moment. So in other words, uh, as I continue to explain to you what polarity and the dipole moments are, when atoms in a molecule share electrons unequally, a dipole moment is formed or is created. And it occurs when one atom is more electronegative than another, resulting into that atom pulling more tightly on the shared pair of electrons, or when an atom has got a lone pair of electrons uh, 
and a difference of electronegativity vector points on the same way. I won't go into the details of showing you the, the vector moment uh, uh, because they may not help you those calculations. Uh, bonding, uh, maybe if, if someone in physical chemistry went into deep, but for our level, we may not need, uh, we may not need th those details of uh, ob orbitals. Huh? Mm -hmm. So, um, but in other words, what I was trying to, to tell you here, uh, I'm trying to avoid going into deep. I was trying to tell you that uh, the carbon chloride bond, the carbon chlorine bond is polar simply because of the difference in electronegativity between carbon and chlorine, creating a dipole moment. And I've been telling that the dipole moment arises as a result of difference in electronegativity. Now, when you have to answer this question, why carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar, and yet the carbon chlorine bond is polar, I would expect you to first show me the fact that chlorine is more electronegative. That is the first thing you need to first tell me. Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. That is not enough. Tell me that, therefore, the chlorine atom tends to attract bonding electrons towards itself, and hence it acquires a partial negative charge. I'm going to send you the work, the one I'm singing it. That is how I want you to be singing it by writing in the paper. So we are saying that this one being more electronegative than carbon, it pulls bonding electrons towards itself, making or acquiring a partial negative charge. And this carbon gains a partial positive charge, making the carbon chloride, the carbon chlorine bond polar. Okay. But however, the whole molecule, carbon tetrachloride, is nonpolar simply because of its structure, tetrahedro in which the chlorine atoms are symmetrically distributed about the carbon atom, creating equal and opposite dipole moments in all directions that cancel out, making the resultant dipole moment zero. When the dipole moment is zero, you don't expect this bond to be polar, okay? What we are trying to say, we are saying that the polarity, the nonpolarity of carbon tetrachloride bond is as a result of the attack of its tetrahedral structure. Okay, we are looking at tetrahedral structure. Mm? Uh, we are looking at the tetrahedral structure. And we are saying that this tetrahedral structure, within this structure, the chlorine atoms are symmetrically distributed. When they are symmetrically distributed, it, uh, they are distributed about the carbon atom. So what? There is created a partial, actually there is created an equal but opposite dipole moments in all directions. In this direction will be a dipole moment, in this direction, a dipole moment, even here, dipole moment, even here, dipole moment. So they can easily cancel out. These dipole moments can easily cancel out having the effective dipole moment as zero, and when the effective dipole moment is zero, then there are can't be polarity in the molecule. If you have understood my point about polarity and non-polarity, type yes, and I see. If you've understood a point about polarity and non-polarity, type yes. Okay, I don't know why members, I see members coming in, joining. I don't know if the problem is with the network. I really do not know whether the problem is network, but some members have not joined. That's why I've decided to record this lesson so that someone who has not attended because of network happens to get it. Okay, so uh, after having answered that, aspect of polarity, 
Now there can come there can come another question where we need to know how these tetrachlorides are formed. The best way to form them, actually, let me also bring it as a question. The way I'm giving you these questions is the same way these questions can appear or maybe appear, maybe appearing, sorry, in this very same way. So for example, I can say with relevant equations, describe how each of the above tetrachlorides can be formed with the relevant equations. Describe how each of above tetrachlorides We want to look at how these tetrachlorides want to look at how these tetrachlorides are are formed. Okay, we want to look at how these tetrachlorides are formed. As I've said, people who did not come earlier, I'm going to send in the recording to the to the WhatsApp to the WhatsApp chat box so that people can follow up. Now, with the equations, describe how each of the above tetrachlorides are formed. How do you form these tetrachlorides? How do you form a carbon tetrachloride? Remember, when they said describe, in case there is a condition for that reaction, you have to indicate it in your working. OK? Now, if we had formed carbon tetrachloride first, for carbon tetrachloride, how do we form it? Form carbon tetrachloride, um, we react chlorine and carbon disulfide. Okay, we react. So one can say carbon tetrachloride. I'm going to give you the, the unit presentation. Uh, carbon tetrachloride is formed by a reaction between chlorine and carbon disulfide. Chlorine and carbon disulfide. Carbon disulfide, remember, is a liquid. So the reaction between chlorine and the carbon disulfide in presence of iron three chloride or aluminium three chloride as catalysts at one, uh, rather at 30 degrees. So one can put the catalysts here. It can be aluminium three, uh, rather it can be aluminium chloride or it can be iron three chloride, okay? One can use iron three chloride or one can use aluminium three chloride at 30. So this reaction of carbon disulfide, carbon disulfide and chlorine will yield carbon, actually yeah, is that right thing? Yeah, to yield carbon tetrachloride liquid and disulfur dichloride. Now in an exam, they can give you this equation that you complete it. You know, in organic chemistry it's funny. They can give you this equation that you complete it. Mm. You form a colorless liquid of carbon tetrachloride and disulfur dichloride liquid. So you need to know how this equation is completed. Okay, so that is how we form carb uh, tri uh, te carbon tetrachloride the re by reacting carbon disulfide with the chlorine in the presence of aluminum chloride or iron three chloride catalyst. Okay, then uh, to form silicon four, form silicon four chloride or silicon tetrachloride, form silicon tetrachloride, what you do, you heat a mixture, this is formed by heating a mixture of silicon four oxide, Eating a mixture of silicon four oxide, all right, and the carbon. We heat a mixture of silicon four oxide and the carbon in the presence of dry current of chlorine. Press all one can say in presence of dry chlorine. Eh? In presence of dry current of chlorine. Okay, so uh, here you must note. You must note the conditions for the reaction and then the equation 
that leads to the formation of that very substance. So what I'm trying to mean, we shall have silicon dioxide, the solid, plus we say that you react it with carbon. They must be two atoms of carbon, solid. We, in place of dry current of chlorine, so we shall also add chlorine. We shall form silicon tetrachloride, which is our liquid, plus and now the oxide and the carbon will form carbon monoxide gas. So this is what this is how we form tetrachlorides. Uh huh. That was for silicon. One may wonder how we form germanium. How we form germanium tetrachloride? To form germanium tetrachloride. What we do? We pass dry chlorine over heated germanium. So we shall just pass dry chlorine over heated magnesium, sorry, heated germanium. So it will be germanium solid plus dry chlorine gas. And this reaction is reversible because germanium tetrachloride can go back liquid. So that is what we form for that particular case of germanium. Then the tin tetrachloride, if you had formed the tin tetrachloride, we pass uh, still dry chlorine, pass dry chlorine over overheated tin. So still we shall pass heated tin, uh, 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 in heated tin we pass dry chlorine and we shall form tin for chloride liquid. So uh, all these reactions, this question can come when they have given it like seven max or eight, because each tetrachloride has gotten a different method of preparing it, okay? So, uh, or, or forming it. Now looking at this, uh, we shall have our tin chlorine to give us tin for chloride. Finally, let's look at how lead for chloride or how lead tetrachloride can be formed. Now, to form lead for chloride, um, when you look at uh, heated lead, heated lead also reacts with the dry chlorine, but it forms lead to chloride, which is in the oxidation state to one that we don't need because we're in plus four. So when lead to, when lead reacts with the dry chlorine, we form lead to chloride. Instead of lead for chloride, which we are interested in because we are interested in tetrachloride, see? But when lead reacts, we form, uh, a dichloride, which we are not interested in. So this method cannot be used to prepare, to prepare lead to, to prepare lead for chloride. That one of heated lead and chlorine. Instead, what we do, um, we react lead for oxide with the concentrated hydrochloric acid. So uh, the reaction takes place when we heat. Rather, when we react lead for oxide solid with the cold concentrated hydrochloric acid. Cold concentrated, cold concentrated hydrochloric acid. So this one will lead to formation of lead for chloride and then water. So that is how we form those uh, chlorides that we have looked at. That's how we form the chlorides that we have looked at. Um, I'm going to talk about the final aspect, which final aspect will be the boiling points of these tetrachlorides that we have talked about. Then uh, I will post the work that has everything, then we just, in, the, in our one, one more lesson, we shall be through with this when we have one more inorganic 
lesson, we shall be through with this. Now, for the case of boiling points, they can give you, uh, they can give you uh, a tetrachloride, carbon tetrachloride, they can give you silicon tetrachloride, they can give you germanium tetrachloride, they can give you uh, tin tetrachloride, they can give you lead tetrachloride, then they can give you their boiling point 77, 58, 83, 114. Lead 4 chloride has not got a boiling, a boiling point, but in, the, in the case when, boil, when heated, for it, it just decomposes. So here, we don't have it. So these are tetrachlorides and these are the boiling points. So they can ask you, explain the trend. Now those are the questions that you have to be uh, eagerly keen with. When we say explain the trend of boiling points or the trend in variation of uh, melting points or boiling points uh, of this, you need to be very, very, very keen. You can see uh, that from here, it decreases from here to here. So one can say the boiling point, of course, you first need to give us the general, the general trend, boiling point, decreases, it decreases from carbon tetrachloride to silicon tetrachloride, and then increases to tin tetrachloride. Then you need to tell me that lead to lead for chloride decomposes at room temperature. So you need to first give me the general trend. Of course, as I've told you, I'm going to send you the presentation. So you just can note the most important statements, then the other work will be detailed. You say that boiling point decreases from carbon tetrachloride up to silicon tetrachloride, and then increases up to tin tetrachloride. Then on your line, you can say lead four chloride or lead tetrachloride decomposes at room temperature, even at room temperature, it can decompose. Now, you have to give me the explanation of your trend. You realize that these liquids are held by Van der Waals forces of attraction. And these Van der Waals forces of attraction, their strength increases with an increase in molecular size, an increase in the total number of electrons in the molecule that can be polarized. Okay. They are at the, the in, within the liquids. We have said that these liquids are held by weak Van der Waals forces of attraction. But however much they are weak Van der Waals forces of attraction, this force of attraction can increase with some prospect. And their increase can be there as a result in, of increase in molecular size or in total number of electrons in the molecules that can be polarized. Now, uh, the silicon tetrachloride, if I'm to begin with the silicon tetrachloride, it has got a lower boiling point than a carbon tetrachloride. Reason? Because silicon is less much electronegative. Silicon is less much electronegative than carbon. Okay? Being less much electronegative, it means that uh, it pulls fewer electrons towards itself. And carbon being much electronegative, it pulls many electrons compared to silicon. And what does it mean? It would mean that uh, this within carbon tetrachloride, there are very many electrons that can be polarized compared to silicon. Okay, so because of the difference in electron negativities. All right. Now, silicon is less much less negative, less electronegative than carbon, and the silicon tetrachloride molecules also have got greater repulsive forces than those of carbon tetrachloride. But when you look at the lead for chloride, lead for chloride is generally unstable. It is unstable to an extent that it composes at room temperature to form a more stable lead to chloride and chlorine, okay? Because you know that lead two compounds 
are more stable in plus two oxidation state than the plus four oxidation state due to an increase in the inert pair effect, as we said. So I'm going to send you the general presentation uh, of this question, and then we see, but it is a very common question uh, about uh, these, uh, uh, about the tetrachlorides. Because when we start the reactions, you are going to enjoy this one more. So I want to first see if there is a question. I see members have not come in and a simple reason is because of network. I don't know why network is disturbing. Could there be any question? Those ones who came late, we started at exactly 11 at 10 minutes past 11, but I have endeavored to record the whole lesson and I'm going to send it to the group. Maybe before we close, I think we can, we can look at also the stability. We can look at the stability of these tetrachlorides. Let's, let's cover it also so that we do, we do a bigger thing at least. There can come a question asking you to discuss the trend in thermostability of tetrachlorides. Discuss the trend in the thermostability of these tetrachlorides. Now, it would need you to have idea about the oxidation states, thermostability inability to decompose. Thermostability, if something is thermally stable, it means that it cannot be decomposed by heat. Now, thermostability decreases from carbon tetrachloride to lead chloride or lead tetrachloride. Thermostability decreases, meaning that at first, this one is much stable, it can't decompose. Uh, even others which follow, we have got silicon tetrachloride, we've got tin tetrachloride, we've got germanium. Actually, after silicon is germanium. Then after germanium tetrachloride, we go to, to tin tetrachloride. Now we say that stability keeps decreasing. And why does it decrease? Carbon tetrachloride, silicon tetrachloride, and germanium tetrachloride, these three, the first three, are thermally stable, or they are, they are stable to heat. Hence, they don't decompose. This one, the first three don't decompose. But tin tetrachloride on strong heating, tin tetrachloride on strong heating, it's a liquid, remember, it will decompose from tin to uh, tin four chloride, rather tin two chloride, which is a solid, and chlorine gas. Mm -hmm. But lead two, rather lead tetrachloride for it, for the case of lead tetrachloride, even at room temperature, it can dissociate from lead two chloride and the chlorine gas. What does it mean? This decrease in thermostability, why the, the, the thermostability is decreasing, it's because the cationic size, the size of these cations increases from carbon four ion, from carbon four ion to, carb, to lead four ion. Okay, so what does it mean? When the cationic size increases from carbon four iron to lead four iron, it means that the element chlorine bond length, the element chlorine bond length, maybe like the 
red chlorine bond red chlorine bond silicon chlorine bond the element chlorine bond length increases when the bond length increases it means that its strength decreases strength decreases that's why i told you last time that if you have a piece of chalk it is easy to break it in the middle but it is not easy to break it like from here and you, you touch here and here and then you break it because when the bond is when when it is short then it is strong but when it is long then it is weak so when the bond length increases the bond strength decreases and when the bond strength decreases then the amount of energy required to break the weakening bond also decreases you put in little amounts of energy to break the bond so you say that the general decrease in the thermostability is as a result of the increase in the cationic size of these atoms rather of these the cation of carbon and the cation of lead so as the cationic size increases the element chlorine bond length also increases so we have an increase in the bond length when the bond length increases the bond strength decreases when the bond strength decreases the energy required to break that bond also reduces and that's how we explain the thermostability of group 4 tetra chlorides i don't want to continue from there because uh, one lesson would be enough for us to complete group 4 elements in case you have any question now i can answer it and we call it a day any question there's no question okay so if there is no question allow me say good time uh tomorrow on the timetable you check very well what is on the timetable is what is going to be covered and at the right time okay i am sure that people have been uh, disturbed by network i uh, hope that tomorrow it gets fine okay i hope that tomorrow it gets fine so that the people come on board so tomorrow applied math at 8 and then now uh, physics okay okay i may switch i may switch tomorrow for those ones who do math i may switch and we have pure so that we complete our integration then on the time of pure we shall have the applied math okay good time would bless you.